Dzień dobry, bardzo mi miło, że Państwo wszyscy tutaj uh, hello, one more time and thank you very much. We are very happy to see you here. Uh, you have all come to listen to um, us talking about Islamic radicalism. Let me introduce our guests, our speakers today, uh, beginning with uh, my left, Claude Gibal. Uh, a French journalist who spent over 10 years in the Middle East, in Egypt, but also traveling in other regions of the country. Przed chwilą wyszła jej książka And she has just released a, a book, Islamistan. It's uh, only in French, but it has been a big uh, bestseller. So it's going to be published in other languages. So Claude Kibal is for many years interested in uh, the topic of Islamic radicalization. She has talked to many people about it. She has uh, made many trips and she's going to share at least some of those stories with you. Uh, left of Claude, we have um, Ali Ildiz, uh, who is a lawyer. He lives in uh, Berlin. And he's a member of board of um, German uh, Forum of Muslims. And he has been a social activist for many years engaging in uh, matters of integration of the Muslim community, in particular in Germany, but in Europe at large as well. However, uh, well, and uh, furthest from me, we have Professor Agata Nabocik, and she is a scholar at the University of Warsaw, the Oriental Studies Department, the European Islam, a chair of European Islam, and she deals with Muslims in Europe. So, and my name is Ludwika Wodek, and I'm a journalist. And I also work uh, doing scholarly work, uh, mostly in nationalism, modernization, mostly in Central Asia, but also in the post-Soviet area and also in the Muslim area. So I think that my interests are somehow, somehow overlap with uh, Muslim uh, radicalization. So, to begin with, what is Islamic radicalism in the first place? We often hear um, things like a woman with a covered face, a bearded man, meaning he's a radical man. So what, what, what is it? What do you think Islamic radicalism is? And how do we tell it apart from uh, just pure um, devotion, religious devotion? Uh, well, first, thank you very much for uh, attending this uh, discussion. Um, what is um, Islamic radicalization, it's, it's, um, uh, it's a big, big, big issue. And I was wondering first, uh, what means Islamism, you know? Um, for us in, in Europe, we tend to uh, talk about Islamism to when, when we refer to anything related to a very conservative vision of Islam, whether it's like practicing or a political um, Islam. Um, what I mean is, Islamism is not something monolithic. We, we often hear about Salafis and Muslim brothers, for instance, uh, and we call, both call them Islamist, uh, even though a Salafi and a Muslim brother hate each other. And if Saudi Arabia is the mother of the Salafi movement, uh, so, um, Saudi Arabia is also uh, maybe the fierce, fiercest adversary of the Muslim Brothers. Um, we call a jihadi an Islamist, but we also call, um, let's say, um, a deputy from um, another um, is political party in Tunisia an Islamist, and they have nothing much in common. Um, yes, uh, sorry to interrupt you, but I have to explain the Polish word. Ponieważ w Polsce to jest jeszcze trudniejsze. 
In Poland, it is even uh, more difficult uh, to understand because Islamist is a cock from English, and we have a Polish uh, a problem because we talk about Islamic uh, fundamentalism, but Islamists in Poland, uh, this is actually a term to refer to scholars dealing with Islam, and this is actually a little confusing, and it might get lost in translation as well. Thank you. Uh, so it's very hard to know, you know, what um, is leading to radicalization, you know. Um, you can wear a veil, you can even wear a face veil, a niqab, um, and not being radicalized if you understand radicalism as um, a path to violence. Um, when we talk about um, this Islamist or Islamic fundamentalism, um, when we refer to groups such as the Muslim Brotherhood, the Muslim Brotherhood, for instance, is a um, political movement founded in Egypt in the late, late 20s in the context of colonial, colonialism uh, and advocating for um, a, a Muslim governance of the society and it was at that time really directed towards against the, the, the British who were in, in, in Egypt at that time. Um, if you compare with Salafis, Salafis is something absolutely different. Salafis, um, so maybe, I don't know if you're much aware of what a Salafi is, maybe you've seen these guys wearing uh, very short trousers above the ankles with big birds uh, like that, um, their wives or the women are always covered, fully covered. You cannot see their faces. Well, actually, what they are, Salafi, um, the, the, the Salaf were the companions of the Prophet. And what the Salafis are doing is that they want to live, um, a, 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 well, the way people lived at the time of the Prophet. That doesn't mean that they don't use a cell phone. It's not a problem for them using a cell phone. Uh, they're not rejecting technology, for instance, as long as technology doesn't interfere with... Uh, just correct me, you know, if I'm wrong. <laughs> but uh, what they reject is everything um, that breaks the tradition and which brings modernity into the Muslim dogma of that time. Well, um, Salafi don't believe in democracy because democracy means that the rule of the law of the people, the law of, um, of, um, of the state is above the law of God and they believe that the law of God is the one to be followed. So that's why they don't believe in democracy. So that's why they split from the, the, the society when they live in societies such as yours or mine in France. And um, the thing is, Normally, Salafis do not, does not interfere into politics. You were asking if it was always related with politics, but the thing is, Salafis or Islamists were always used by politics in, Ara in the Arabic word by authoritarian uh, Arab regimes as very powerful tools. Uh, in Egypt, in the 50s, President Nasser, um, who was close from the Muslim Brotherhood at the time, once he got into power, fought the Muslim Brothers, and after, after him came um, President Sadat, and President Sadat uh, was remembered because he was the one who made a peace agreement with Israel. Uh, President Sadat used the Islamist against his leftist uh, opposition, so it helped the, the Islamists to grow in, in the society, and also President Sadat in 1971 introduced the Sharia, the Islamic law, as uh, the main um, inspiration for uh, the constitution. And after him came President Mubarak, and I rem remember President Sadat was killed by uh, Islamic fundamentalists. And after him came President Mubarak, and Mubarak used the Muslim Brothers as well. At that time, I was living in Egypt, and as a journalist, we used to describe you know, the Muslim Brotherhood as a, a forbidden yet tolerated uh, movement. Uh, forbidden yet 
tolerated. That means that the Muslim Brothers were everywhere. Everywhere the state allowed them to be. They were taking care of the poor. They were, you know, like vast areas of the society left to them. You know, education, um, charities. Um, I mean, almost everything that the government, which, which was very corrupted, didn't want to get into. Um, and it was like a kind of deal, and they were useful scarecrows. Um, it's very easy when you're uh, a dictator and when you are asked by, let's say, your um, foreign allies to comply with the rules of democracy, to say, oh, the only alternative is me or Claude, I suggest, sugeruję, żebyśmy jeszcze wrócimy do sytuacji w Egipcie i w ogóle całego. We will go back to the situation in Egypt and the mechanism used by dictatorships in the regions, which, even though officially they do not recognize radicalists, but they nevertheless have led to radicalization. We are going to talk about all those factors, but I would nevertheless like to ask the other two guests, because Claude really focused on telling us how those different political movements, or not quite political movements, in the Muslim world uh, look like, what they look like in Egypt and in um, Arab countries. Uh, what about your opinion? What do you think Islamic radicalism is in Europe? What does it stand for? And what's the difference between radicalism and uh, being a good Muslim, uh, being a very devout Muslim. Um, so two things, uh, Islam, politics, and violence as a tool to reach your goals. Yeah. So, so the, uh, you want to focus on what is a radical Islamist or, and what is, uh, no, what, uh, what is an Islamist? In my, yes, yeah, in, the first and place. And in the European context. Yeah, and, uh, yeah in my point of view, um, it's a psychological moment uh, we have to look at. Um, the, uh, the Islamists, they uh, view their uh, identity, their Muslim identity, as the uh, only, uh, um, it's, it's the only, um, how to say, the, the identity is the only thing where they look through. Like, uh, I am a Muslim, and from this standpoint, they look at the state, they look at the society, they, uh, they evaluate, they value, they, uh, they check um, the, the system, but only through their Muslim identity. They don't, uh, it's, it's something like, um, yeah, the, uh, yeah the, the Muslim identity is the only one thing which counts, and uh, they also uh, value other Muslims. They, they look at them, uh, are they good Muslims or bad Muslims? And uh, they try to, uh, try even to excommunicate uh, um, other Muslims because in their point uh, of view, they are not real Muslims. So uh, there is all, everything is divided into good uh, or bad. Mm -hmm. Przepraszam, że przerwę na chwilę. To jest dokładnie to, co w książce Claude swojej pisała. Excuse me, this is exactly what Claude wrote in her book. So nobody is going to say uh, I'm radical, a radical Muslim or I'm an Islamist. Uh, they just say I'm the true Muslim, I'm the real one, I'm the genuine one. And all of the others are not quite Muslims, or maybe the Muslims in, in the the wrong way, so to speak. didn't get the question. No, no, I just wanted that, that this is exactly what Claude yeah. wrote in her book, that uh, actually I, I no <laughs> <laughs> uh, people, they just don't say about themselves that I am Islamist. They say I'm the real Muslim. The way I'm Muslim, this is the, the correct way of being a Muslim. This is exactly what you said yeah. also. Yeah. Now the question? <laughs> no, 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 I just interrupted. Okay. Actually, Państwo po prostu... You mo presumably, most of you do not know the book, and the book has really been a bit of an excuse to hold this session. So I wanted to make things precise. Uh, 
the, the question uh, is about, I mean, I, I can only uh, say that's correct. That's, that's the thing in my view, uh, how we have to look at, at the people. I mean, um, uh, the Muslim, the, the usual Muslim, um, wh what uh, identity they, uh, they have is mostly formed, for example, by Muslim Brotherhood, uh, Uh, organizations strongly linked to them, then they tend to be uh, to, 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 to get um, uh, Islamist. Yeah, it's uh, it's it's not a, a wonder. Huh? Mm -hmm. uh, and um, at which point does it begin where someone gets involved in politics and then you have Islam as the only way and only through Islam can we solve all problems because you were speaking about identity being a Muslim is like the single most important feature and you per perceive everything in the light of being a Muslim you're not a Syrian or, or a German or a man or a father or, well, a worker, you know, in an industry, like textiles industry or, or something, but in the first place, you're a Muslim. This is the main identity, but how does that relate to the political search of solutions and for Islam being the only political way? Or is there a group in Islam uh, of people who would perceive their, uh, that this is their main identity, but still we wouldn't say they are radicals? thing is um, that you have to uh, there are there is a strong Muslim movement but not represented by uh, the normal Muslim organizations uh, the normal mu Muslim organizations uh, which are highly represented in society and in uh, in the political debate they ha they are they have mostly a political ag agenda they want to change society so and we have uh, other people who really accept uh, the structures of those our society we have Muslims who accept that um, their their Muslim identity is uh, is not higher than than the laws of the state, and this is the, there comes the point. Um, there are Muslims solely in uh, in the political uh, active in the political debate only to change to change uh, the the structures of society uh, more in a certain way, which is. Um, which is compliant to, to, to their view of Islam. So everything, uh, when, when the, uh, they want to change their life, they want, to, uh, they, went w w they want their children not to go to uh, s uh, swimming lessons and so on and so on. So this is a point uh, where uh, I think uh, it starts to be political. When, we, um, when children, how we raise children in our open society, when uh, in school they are not allowed to go to excursions and so on. They are not allowed to uh, swimming lessons, sp sport lessons, etc. That is the beginning of political Islam, in my point of view. Thank mm you. -hmm. Thank you. Hello and good afternoon, everyone. I'm going to speak to the to Professor Janusz Stanetsky, the Pol Poland's most eminent, eminent uh, uh, expert on uh, Islam, and he says that there are three levels. There are fundamentalists. You can say there are florists who are uh, leading a life which is uh, in line with the life in the times of the prophet and in the seventh century and this used to be the best arrangement of the society and they're trying to be Clo as close as possible. They are idealists in a sense and this actually excludes those children uh, from social life. These are the quietists. And the children, when they reach um, adulthood, they would rebel against their parents. Like we have um, graduates of Roman Catholic schools and they are then against, they turn against their parents and they become um, avid communists because the pendulum just swings in the opposite direction. So they're just living in their own world. And um, Professor Dansky also says there are also people who are integrists. So they would like everyone to follow their way of life. 
So indeed, among fundamentalists, there is this trend to really unify, homogenize their society. Some people have a mission just by living the life they want to live, and they invite people to join them to, at meetings. But there are also some people who want to do it through organizations, and this is where the danger begins of interfering with politics. So let's do it using political ways. But that's not radical yet. However, that's another step. And there are terrorists. These are radical people who would like to impose their vision by force, uh, not by using political power. And I think uh, this subdivision really gives us a good perspective on things. And like I said before, we tend to see those uh, movements as, uh, as one, but Salafi being the same as the Muslim Brotherhood. But when we were looking at the elections in Egypt, they had uh, some women, um, women candidates. But when Salafis had uh, candidates for members of parliament, the members, uh, their photographs were not shown, like they would use an image of a flower and so on. So those two movements uh, actually did not quite collaborate with one another. On the contrary, they might have similar goals uh, to make Islam um, into a political tool, but they still mutually disagree. But what they do have in common, those various mm, fundamentalists, we've been talking about the Sunnis, but um, or, or the Muslim Brothers, or the Salafis, or movements such as Al Qaeda, or the so called uh, Islamic State, they are all anti Shiites. So this is something that all of them share a very strong dislike towards people who are Muslims and who perceive their Islam in a different way. Way. So those movements, this anti-Shiite uh, sentiment can be um, manifested in various ways. For instance, in Belgium, one imam uh, perished in an attack on a uh, Shiite uh, mosque. So I think that not everyone from the Salafites or not every Salafi um, fundamentalist is a threat. The way you live, well, you might hurt your children, but then again, parents are free to raise their children the way they like. And hopefully those children will sooner or later see that living in a mainstream society might be much more fun and much more cool than being excluded. And there is one more thing in Europe, and I'm, I'm not really a, a scholar studying uh, Salafis uh, or uh, fundamentalism, but uh, Professor Lika Martinson, a friend of mine in Scandinavia, she deals with that. And um, she employs Sigmund Bauman's uh, theories of the new um, tri tribe or new tribalism uh, to explain that. So there are people who are converts and who convert to Salafi Islam, people who are lost in the contemporary society, and they get clear answers how to live how to dress, what kind of clothes to wear, and you know, the kind of appearance that they need to have, you know, the beard and, and so on. We might be surprised that some women would fully cover their face and so on, but this is exactly what gives them a sense of belonging to the new tribe. And uh, we're no longer alone. A group will not abandon you. We know that these communities are very important in the Western world when you have a sense of alienation and lack of purpose. And this gives them uh, a sense of purpose. And this brings us to another question that I would like to raise. What makes people become radicalized and uh, reach out to the fun more fundamental kind of Islam. You can have a look 
the dress code of these men fundamental. They resemble the outfit from the 7th century. So on the one hand, we've got very devout parents and children that negate uh, this uh, attitude. On the other hand, we've got parents who accept uh, the secular nature of the state and children who seek their roots, their identity, and they decide to to live in a different way and to manifest their uh, Islamic identity in a different way. And I, now I would like to ask all the panelists uh, to address this issue and uh, to enumerate some examples from your experience and tell us about the process of becoming radicalized, but not in general, but on the basis of uh, case studies, real-life scenarios, so that we are not uh, too abstract, but get into uh, details and learn practical examples. Um, well, about practical examples, it, it depends of um, which kind of person you want to talk about. But um, what I can tell you about, because it's maybe easier for us as we all Europeans here, I mean, we all come from European countries maybe, or mainly. Um, I am French, I am from the south of France. Um, and in Egypt, um, in 2005, after, the, after the, the war in Iraq, actually after 2003, um, I've noticed a lot of um, foreign people, foreign Muslim, coming to Egypt and wearing this kind of outfits. It was really weird, you know, you were going to the supermarket and you could see people, you know, looking like they were going out of the Tora Bora caves in Afghanistan and they were in Egypt and they were speaking with a very, very strong French accent. And every Egyptian people were actually at that time looking at them thinking, oh, who are they? Actually, a lot of people were coming like that in Egypt to perform what they call Hijra, which is um, the, the equivalent of the Jewish Aliyah, uh, which means going to um, going back to a, a, a Muslim country where they can live accordingly to their faith. I wanted to meet one of them, and I've heard about a girl recently arrived in Egypt. So I, 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 I've met her, and it was very weird. You know, she was she was wearing a face veil. We were in this uh, mall. Uh, in Cairo, and she was uh, sipping her uh, a drink um, under, you know, her niqab like that. She was, uh, and she was talking to me. And eventually, I found out we had exactly the same age. Her name was Christelle, but she took a kunya, which is a, a, a nickname um, um, the Salafi used uh, in order to be identified by the by a, a Muslim name, um, the, usually the, the name of uh, their first child. And she took a kunya, and she was called um, Um Ahmed, which means the mother of Ahmed. So uh, Christelle, Um Ahmed, uh, was um, the same age as I was. And eventually, during the conversation, she said, oh, I'm from Montpellier. And I just stopped and I said, oh, I'm from Montpellier as well. And she said, oh, really? How old are you? Oh, I'm just the same age. And where have you, where have you been to school? <laughs> well, I've been to this school. And I was like, oh, my God. You know, we had friends in common. We've been to the same nightclubs. We've, you know, we had the same background. And we were sitting in this cafe in Cairo. I, I was a journalist. And she could have been another myself. And she was wearing a niqab. And I could not understand, you know, what can, I, I wanted to understand why um, a girl like me um, decided to embrace uh, Islam in this way. And she told me that she, when she was 16 and 17, um, as, I mean, almost every teenager, she was looking for, um, she was looking for, for a cause. She was looking for something transcendent. She was looking for a, a, a meaning in her life. We live in a world where progress doesn't, uh, is not a guarantee anymore for a better future. 
uh, technology and so on brings nowadays more questions than before 50 years ago or 80 years ago. Um, and she was, she wanted to find answers and she had a friend of her, he was a young Muslim, he gave her leaflets about Islam, Islam and science, Islam and uh, motherhood, Islam and uh, mathematics, Islam and everything. And she started to read them, you know, at that time she was, well, let's say she was born Christian, but she didn't really care about religion. And she found, she told me she found answers. Everything, she, she had questions and there were, ask, there were answers for every question. She told me also, look, when you die, you are accountable for the sins and the good things you have done in your life. She said, don't you think it's more logical to think this way rather than thinking that someone has sacrificed himself for your sins, such as Jesus? She thought that was more logical. So she had answers for, that, for everything. And when I said, okay, you can believe that, but um, why did you decide you know, to hide yourself from the society with this uh, veil on your face? And she said it was a way to be heard for what she had to say and not to be looked at, a, um, at an object of desire. And she told me, well, you see my veil as a, a submission. And she told me, don't you think we, we as women in Europe have to face another kind of submission, which is being fit, good looking, we, you, we, the, on, on publicity, you know, when you, whenever you want to, 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 to sell yogurt, you, there's a woman, a naked woman, you know, to, in, in the advertisement. So don't you think it's also a way to, um, of oppression on women? And, you know, in some ways she was, well, that was logical. So everything is logical, was logical for this, uh, for this girl. And that's how, you know, um, little by little, she she uh, she decided to to leave France to go and live in a Muslim country, because she was looking for an identity, and this identity was not going through belief, but it was also by copying the code of the tribe, as you said, she wanted to belong to because she needed an, ident an identity, she needed a, a brotherhood, she needed a community. Um, and all that was linked to, to imitating um, a cultural identity which was linked to the Arabic country. So she learned Arabic, she dressed like um, Arab in, 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 in the Arab world. Um, and that was maybe more important than the belief itself. And do you keep in touch with her? Do you know what has happened to her? Uh, yes, I've kept in touch with her, yeah, yeah. And she left Egypt to live in England. Uh, and she, she wrote me an email one day. Um, she was mad at me because uh, she, in, in an article I wrote, I, I was writing um, Mahomet, um, uh, Muhammad, um, Muhammad the prophet, and she said um, it was something very bad because I should say Muhammad and not Mahomet. Uh, and she was focusing on things like that, you know, on, on details and not on the beliefs. Uh, Ali. Chciałam zapytać, jak pan... I, and now I would like to address my question to you. You also represent the second European generation, so to speak. Your parents were born in Turkey, then they came to Germany. You were born and brought up in Germany. And very often we can hear that it is the second key generation or even the third generation that you represent. The first generation accepted the uh, European uh, roots. The second generation was lost and the third generation gets back to its roots. What, what does it look like from your experience, from your perspective? Do you know similar stories that could be typical of certain processes? 
So in my point of view, uh, Claude just uh, sketched uh, a case where a convertite was, uh, uh, was involved. Uh, in my point of view, the second generation, um, no, uh, the first generation was uh, here in Germany or ca came to Europe for labor reasons. They wanted to work. They uh, were migrants who only wanted to work for a couple of years and go back. And they came from uh, a period where even Turkey, for example, was uh, secular. Um, where you were not allowed to uh, weigh a, a niqab or whatever uh, um, scarf uh, uh, in school and etc. So the first, the first uh, generation of migrants the first generation of migrants, they were not that deeply religious, but they didn't really accept the society. That is something completely different. They were, uh, they didn't, uh, they hadn't uh, such a big, uh, they didn't have a big impact on, on the society itself where they moved in because they were just simple labor workers in a, in a factory. And, but what they taught their own uh, children, uh, the second generation, was uh, that we uh, that we have to take care of our traditions, that um, that uh, that there is a patriarchal system existing. So within their families, the nucleus of the society, they were deeply uh, conservative, and uh, it it, it, is, it was forbidden to uh, question authorities. And they were not able to make up their own minds and uh, have a critical conscience. And in this, in this culture, yeah, in this patriarchal uh, culture, they uh, they grew up, and um, uh, they were always taught that the the collective is more is more worthy uh, is more worthy than uh, the individual itself. So. Uh, that's the reason uh, we, and we in Germany or in Europe, we always learned one thing, the human dignity is untouchable, and the second thing is you are always allowed to choose uh, the way of your own life, your self-determination rights are not questioned by anybody as long as you don't interfere into other rights. But this view wasn't taught to them. They were always seen as an individual, as a member of a tribe, maybe, so to say. And uh, in this context, um, they, they grew up somehow also religious, and now I come, I come to a certain point, which is really um, important for me. Where do they uh, worship? Where do they go to? To mosques. But uh, to whom do these mosques belong? Mostly, uh, they, uh, they are ideologically linked to Turkey, they are ideolo ideologically linked to Saudi Arabia or whatever. Like in Germany, at least 90%, even maybe more, of the mosques are strongly connected to a, a foreign government. And now looking at Turkey, for example, what government do we have there? Yeah, what do they transport? What informations uh, do they uh, do they impose or, or communicate within these societies? So, so they are deeply anti uh, uh, anti um, westlich uh, against this Western society, and uh, yeah, they grew up. They feel themselves as a stranger. They uh, they are, there is build up a Muslim a strong Muslim identity. They, uh, they are always uh, somehow, uh, yeah, how to say, uh, they feel discriminated, always stru structurally. There is a structure of discrimination within society, whereas other minorities, like, uh, uh, like Kurdish people, Alevi, uh, Armenians, whatever uh, you choose, which, uh, whichever migrant group you choose, as long as uh, they are not Muslim, they don't uh, say that so openly that we as a collective, uh, that we feel discriminated. So, and out of this feeling that they are discriminated and they are always taught to be discriminated, they uh, build up a rage and anger against society. And some of them leave this deeply political, Islamic uh, ground 
and go to the Salafi movement, Wahhabi movement, because they want to do something. That is how, in my point of view, uh, some of them are, uh, are devol developing uh, a jihadist uh, thinking of the world. And yeah, um, I, in my point of view, we have really to, um, to uh, dis disconnect this link between the mosques we have here to the for to foreign governments and to institutions which are deeply anti-Western. Tak, właśnie tutaj, ja pamiętam też taką rozmowę z Basamem T. I can recollect a talk with Basam T, a researcher coming from Syria, a researcher on fundamentalism, Islamic fundamentalism, uh, living in Germany. He draw the attention to the same thing. European countries, due to the fact that they take care of, secular, of being secular and separating state from religion, they gave the floor uh, to fundamentalists outside Europe. And I would like to address this uh, question to Agata Nalborczyk, who dealt with education issues. Yeah, but before I move on to this topic, I would like to mention what Nira Nielsen told me one time. He wrote a book on Muslims in Europe, Muslims in Western Europe in 1992, and he initiated studies on, um, on Islamism in Europe. And he wrote about a student in Birmingham, a Muslim student. Uh, she was not wearing hijab. And one day she wore niqab. And he asked her why, and she said, we are trying to integrate into the society, we are trying to live just like the Britons do, and you treat us in this way? And it turned out that her younger brother went to Pakistan on holiday, and in Pakistan everyone wears guns, so he got uh, photographed with uh, a gun of his uncle, children of his age like guns very much, so he took this gun into his hands and someone took a photo of him. And then a teacher saw this photo of him with guns and he didn't ask their parents to come to school and explain what happened, but he notified the, po the police and the police entered uh, the, um, the flat where this family lived and asked uh, how this boy accessed guns, because uh, they assumed this was a radical family. And this shows us where the feeling of exclusion comes from. And we sometimes uh, see that uh, the European society is uh, too eager to look for radicals. And now getting back to education, just like Ali said, societies uh, that uh, came to Europe uh, from the Arab world, they came to Europe as labor force and they passed on some religious knowledge to their children. And this religious knowledge came from their places of origin, their villages, their village mosques. This was not knowledge that correspond to the knowledge that children who gain education in European schools get. And the teachers that uh, teach at mosques, for example, uh, there was a teacher from Pakistan at one of the mosques in Europe, and he didn't allow children to ask any questions. He just focused on passing on the knowledge he had and uh, did not welcome any questions. And this first generation of children, they, they do not know any other patterns of education. They don't know that they can ask questions. And this kind of knowledge is not relevant, is not appropriate for children in European countries. It is uh, uh, really absurd that uh, they cannot ask, ask questions, that they are beaten as a punishment. And these children want to learn something about Islam, about their religion. They're looking for their own identity, for their own dignity. And then, unfortunately, they face very modern uh, 
content on religion, for example, computer games, internet websites prepared by radical groups who in this way are, are, are trying to recruit new radicals. And these children who cannot rely on their education in schools where they can't ask questions, they find education which is taught by radicals using very modern tools that are appropriate for the modern modern society and they get attracted by this content. And I also heard a story in Birmingham that even if there is a prayer during um, a day at the mosque, these radicals wait on the stairs of the mosque and distribute uh, DVD films to, to these children so that uh, they can get access to this radical information. So we have a lack of education, which, which results in the fact that children are looking for education in different ways. And those who are looking for radicals, they have money, they have funds, so they can afford to position web pages on Google, so that when you uh, search, uh, when you enter Islam in uh, Google, you can access a website that is uh, run by radicals because they had the funds necessary to position this page uh, in Google. And you said something about mosques. These societies are really poor. They don't have enough funds to maintain, to support imams. So they are very often supported by the Ministry of Religion and this, these Imams, they come from the outside, they do not speak the local language and the education that they pass on does not correspond to what children would like to hear, although research on radicalism in Austria led by Professor Riediger showed that children who come from families where parents are devout Muslims and take their children to mosques and are trying to pass on the knowledge themselves and I'm not talking about Salafis now, just ordinary Muslims. These children rarely become radical because they are rooted in peaceful kind of uh, Islam. They do not feel the need to look for the answers outside of the family. One more situation related to the Islamic State. This is the recruitment of young women. So far, the movements dealing with violence uh, for the sake of Islam treated women just like someone who can help. However, nowadays also young women are recruited. They are sought for on the web and seducted. They are seduced, so to say, or there are advertisements placed online that someone is looking for nurses, for example. And these women apply for these uh, job offers and then it turns out that uh, they are recruited seduced, convinced that they, they do not have to ask their parents uh, to, to agree to go uh, somewhere, because uh, you probably know that women have to ask uh, parents in Islam to, to be able to go abroad. So in this way, radicals are trying to seek women, to recruit women, and then these women marry, uh, go abroad and marry some men, and they feel fulfilled. I wanted to pick up one point you said um, about, about the mosques um, and run by uh, other states. Uh, the imams, uh, for example, in the, um, in the DTIP, the DTIP is a Turkish Union of uh, Religious Affairs in Germany. And there the Imams are um, 
assigned for five years roundabout. But they come from Turkey, directly from Turkey. That's the point you said. I only want to uh, go to a little bit more into that detail because I think it's really relevant why on the other side the uh, the uh, Salafi movement uh, is uh, has a uh, better uh, impact or is, is um, they are speaking the language of the uh, European e uh, youth because um, they are most often they, they speak and preach in German what for example in, uh, in, in Germany we have 900 mosques belonging around about uh, 900 maybe only 700 uh, sometimes they overestimate their own uh, numbers but um, these imams they only preach in, Ger uh, in Turkish for example that means you have a house of worship where uh, an Arabic uh, Muslim cannot go because he cannot understand them. So, and for the second and third generation uh, of, uh, of the community of migrants who do not really uh, properly speak Turkish or Arabic, uh, where, where shall they go? They are go then going to the uh, German-speaking uh, imams. And these are most often uh, Salafi, mm -hmm. Wahhabi, Salafi uh, imams. I would like to go back in time a little bit because so far we've been saying that we've been subdividing the Muslim community in Europe um, separating them from non-European Muslim countries. But overall, let us all think about the following. On the one hand, we have radicalization, not all, but some uh, groups of uh, Muslims in Europe, and the research has shown that contrary to most Polish media say, it's not really the case that uh, more people get radicalized radicalized, then they get secularized, secularized, it's actually the other way around. But anyway, on the other hand, we have uh, a return to Muslim roots in Muslim countries. Very often you hear stories from Algeria, from Tunisia, from the Maghreb countries, who are saying that somebody who used to be an atheist and used to go for a drink of beer after work, now they observe Ramadan and their wives are wearing at least a hijab, but very often their face is fully covered or veiled. And I'm just wondering, where was that stone that started the avalanche of radicalization? Uh, can we look at it in the failure of decolonization, meaning that those countries did not create any new hope for uh, those people? Or maybe this was the war of uh, Afghanistan. Uh, against the Muslim world, and where can we look for the beginning? How did the snowball start going? It all started at one time, of course, decolonization, decolonization uh, has a role into that. Um, um, it maybe came with the dismantled of uh, the Ottoman Empire, also because um, all, I mean, that moment really opened a door for a lot of things. I think that the first, I mean, turning point, second turning point for me, maybe 1979. And it's a very important year. 1979 is the invasion of Afghanistan, which led, you know, to um, the war with the Mujahideens, uh, Bin Laden, then Al Qaeda, as you know. Well, 79, so was the invasion of Afghanistan was also the attack on, in, in Mecca of um, uh, um, an Islamist political group who wanted to topple the um, Saudi monarchy. They took hundreds, I can't remember, hundreds of people hostages. There were hundreds of deaths. We don't often remember that story, but that was really important for the Saudi monarchy, uh, which I mean, they retaliated in spreading um, counter-powers in the Muslim words, and their counter-power is uh, Wahhabism, Salafism. And 79 is also the Islamic revolution in Iran, so the, 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 the triumph of uh, the Shia uh, Islamic revolution. 
so all this is really important to understand, and you can also add the Israeli Arab words, uh, wars, sorry, uh, and the, the 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 war in the Gulf in 1991, with you know many many GIs and women soldier uh, in um, a sacred land of Islam, wearing shorts, short sleeves. It was it was a tremendous shock for uh, the Muslim world, what happened in 1991 in Saudi Arabia, um, and a Muslim country attacking and um, helping to attack another Muslim country for a Western coalition. Um, so these are historical landmarks. As for Egypt, I would say that 9-11's attacks were really important uh, because I was in Egypt at that time, and I remember a lot of friends of mine, Westernized people, they were not always wearing a um, veil or whatever. Um, these people, suddenly with what happened in, during, you know, after 9-11 attacks, you know, um, um, Muslim people were treated as terrorists, as you said, with um, the, 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 the Pakistani boy you talked about. Um, when they, whenever they were travel, uh, traveling, for instance, in the United States, those people who used to be respected were not respected anymore. They were treated like terrorists. They were crossing the borders with officers telling them, okay, step aside, I'm going to check your passport. Uh, <laughs> it also happened with my landlord, who used to be Christian, but with an Arabic name, and it was treated th that way. For the Muslims at that time, a lot of preachers said, okay, our nation, the, 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 the nation of Islam is being attacked uh, because we have seen we are not good enough we are um, i mean we are attacked as a as a community look uh, everywhere in the world uh, muslims are pointed that way so this really fill fill the ground for the uh, fundamentalist to to gain more and more influence of, on on society just as the islamic state is doing today actually because what the islamic state is saying, uh, if you watch the videos, for instance, I remember three days after the Paris attacks, there was this ISIS video saying, um, it was addressing the Muslims in France, and I mean, the message was, hey, you Muslims of France, join us. You're not gonna stay with this society. You don't really belong in. Look how people are treating you. You, will, you, you can copy them, you will, be, you, you will never be a part of them. So you have to be either with them or with us. So join the caliphate, join your brothers. Uh, because you will be chased as Muslims, you know, so uh, you will be chased for your religion. All this really help the, because the, the only choice, you know, was, uh, is always to, is a binary choice. Uh, you have to be a Muslim, you are considered as a Muslim, or, you're, or not. But you have to make a choice. All these events uh, really contributed to ask uh, the Muslim community to make a choice and to, um, to, to, to show off as Muslim and to show off as good Muslim. And we were talking before about metaphysics and the need for everything. Um, in the Muslim, well, you're much more, uh, much more uh, competent and skillful to talk about that, but uh, on, on f f the afterlife is really important. And you are, as I said, accountable for your afterlife. Uh, and it's just like gaining points, good points for every actions you do. But you have no way to know if your action is good or not. You have, uh, you, you always, you're always in doubt if what you do is good. So the others are telling you if you're a good Muslim or not. So you always have to show off mm. with your action to show you're a good Muslim uh, enough. And that is really important in these times where we all face uncertainty, we all have questions, and uh, fundamentalism is giving answers to these uh, questions. 
Uh, yeah, I want to also pick up this point again, authority. Uh, you said that, and I completely agree with you, that uh, the, uh, the fail of the Ottoman Empire um, is one of the key points, because the caliphate was, caliphate was, uh, was um, um, well, abolished, yeah, abolished, that's the word, exactly. And now, uh, that's a point where, where the uh, Salafi have, uh, the Wahhabi Salafi movement has it really easy, because there is no authority left to say this is uh, Islamic, this is uh, the right way you have to behave as a Muslim. So we really have to go back like 100 years, 1924. So, and uh, after that, there were some uh, events you already said. Uh, maybe one thing is I can add is uh, that in 1961 in Saudi Arabia, there was uh, established this uh, university where they started uh, to, um, to educate imams and sending them worldwide. So that is also a point uh, where, where you have to look at. Uh, they were sending the, the imams throughout the world uh, to uh, yeah, to missionieren, um, um, uh, to missionieren, to uh, <laughs> yeah, a mission. Yeah. Okay, and uh, yeah, and after that, I agree, totally agree that um, in Afghanistan, what happened after after the Afghanistan war was that all the jihadists, the mujahideen, they went to the Arab world, back to the Arab world. And there they started their mission again uh, within these societies. So, uh, and we come then to the point, uh, Syria. Syria. Um, in my point of view, uh, what is really attracting to uh, the people is that there is a state, that it, it has a structure like a state, that they uh, label themselves as a caliphate. There is uh, the rise of the caliphate again. Uh, and this attracts the people. And what we did wrong as a Western society, in my point of view, is that we still um, use terrorist organizations of, uh, of a means of geopol uh, geopolitical uh, strategies. And uh, it was the Mujahideen, uh, it was... Uh, um, it were somehow al-Nusra, for example. We want to topple the uh, Syrian uh, regime of Assad because Assad was uh, closely and is closely linked to I Iran and uh, to Russia. So uh, all these things, um, yeah, they show that we have a poor choice of... Um, we made a poor choice of uh, partners, local partners. We always helped not always, but really quite often we have those guys uh, only uh, and make them stronger only to uh, to uh, to eliminate the other uh, foe of ourselves. And what we had in the end is an enemy much stronger and bigger uh, than the other one before. Yeah, uh, that's the point I wanted to make. Yes, indeed, and this is really true that not very many people understand that Osama bin Laden was actually trained by the US to fight in Afghanistan, and this is where he acquired some skills which he then used in different ways. Let me go back to you uh, to the talk about using Islam as a tool for, in political fighting. I spent quite a lot of time in Syria. And I could tell uh, how Syria changed from being a secular country. When I was being there at a, as a student, there were two rows of ladies in hijabs, and they were sitting in the front, the ladies there. And then uh, we used to say that five or six years ago, there had been no ladies wearing hijabs in lectures. And then I came after some time, and there were more rows of women in hijabs. 
So this could show how the society is using religious symbols, that was obviously the case, uh, to show that we are against the regime, the, the authorities. This was a secular regime, of course, which on the one hand, you know, the, the ruling family was um, among the elevates, but officially they were building communism or socialism. So if you showed yourself as a religious person, all that it meant was you were against the government. But slowly but surely, the situation evolved and people would be wearing headscarves to show that they're against the regime. And women who were wearing headscarves, then they taught their daughters to wear headscarves as well. So there was a, a, originally a quite innocent way to show your religiousness. And then it evolved into something else. Uh, and that, uh, Guy Sarman, um, he wrote a book, uh, Children of uh, Sarman, and uh, this book has not been published in Polish yet, but it shows how Arab countries changed and tried to transform their systems out of colonization and under uh, the influence of Western world, including communism, what was we can treat it as part of the Western world, and then they failed to reform their societies and their countries. And then as, as a result of many ideologies from the West, the valuable individuals uh, well, they were wondering, you know, why do we not get a middle class? Because all of those valuable individuals who could oppose the dictatorship, they were either forced to emigrate or they were locked in prison or they were silenced because they were facing many repressions. And for this reason, we're saying those societies are not democratic, uh, like uh, President Hafezalah. So he was elected in uh, general elections, and later on he just made sure that he would be re-elected and re-elected again. And then when I attended the next election, everybody from my students' dormitory had to march out, and everybody had to vote, and it was open voting, and everybody was controlled to make sure that everybody was voting, and everybody voted for him, and there was 99% uh, of people voting for him, and they had complete turnout. So, being religious used to be a very safe way of showing that you were in opposition. You couldn't be sentenced for being religious, for instance. And we need to also remember another thing, because um, we need to talk about the attack on Iraq, because I think American attack on Iraq, with the excuse which was far too contrived about chemical weapons, which was not there, and it felt absurd that Saddam Hussein was accused of uh, perhaps possibly being ready to support al-Qaeda and, uh, and of um, being willing to support fun fundamentalist religious movements. And of course, it wasn't what he would have done. So as a result, Americans attacked Iraq, but they didn't have an idea of what to do next. So the state collapsed, and that was the defalsification. So everyone who used to be uh, involved in uh, al baf the party, they were removed from the post. And there was the military, the police, all the civil servants, and so on. And all of a sudden, we didn't have any army, we didn't have any civil servants, any police, and, and the state just collapsed. And people who used to hold important posts as policemen or as the military men, and remember, they had been very well trained because they had been in the eight-year Iraqi run a war, so they knew how to handle weapon. And uh, Anthony Shardin wrote a book about uh, Iraq on the eve of American invasion. So weapons were everywhere. And those former Iraqi soldiers who used to serve um, at Saddam Hussein, well, they fueled ISIS because this is how they found their expression. Uh, and then they were deprived of means of subsistence 
resistance, so they joined radicals as a way to survive. Let me ask the last question. We've got 20 minutes left, and the last question relates to the Islamic State. Ali said something which I think is quite crucial. In a sense, this organization pretends to be the new caliphate. And my question is, is there, new, is there a new quality to these new additions of jihadi organizations? For the first time, we have something that is not a state, but maybe it resembles state to the highest extent, because it, it has a territory that it controls, it has its own uh, revenues from oil deposit on this territory. And the fact that these fundamental and radical violent organization exists, well, it emerged because of a number of uh, mistakes of regimes and uh, the Western politics. However, does this bring about new quality to the issue that is of most interest to us, which is a radical Islam and terrorism that uses Islam as its ideology? More or less. <laughs> um, you're right when you say that the so-called uh, Islamic State resemble a, a, a real state. That's how they attract people. Um, you were talking about the, the Iraqi war in 2003. Um, a war to promote democracy, which actually aimed at seizing natural resources and strategic locations, while the public um, uh, speech of the United States was um, about a greater Middle East and uh, democracy. There was this lie about the chemical weapons um, um, in Iraq, and um, there was the Abu Ghraib a prison scandal. I don't know if you remember that. You maybe remember these awful pictures of um, Iraqi prisoners being humiliated, tortured, um, people urinating on their faces and so on. It was, um, you, I mean, you can't believe how shocking it was for the Arabs. It really marks something really important. After decolonization, people um, had anger about the states Western states, not against the values of these states. Um, people in Africa or in the Middle East were asking for democracy, not anymore. There, there is uh, um, a lot of people are rejecting these values because there was no, there is no coherence between the the way um, the Western world is acting and the values it's promoting. There is always this, this, um, this connection between the two. The Islamic State is, um, is actually surfing on social despair, for instance, in European communities to track people, injustice, feeling of vic victimization, and so on. They also propose, propose uh, on my opinion, uh, a, a new world order. Everything has, I mean, for a lot of people, everything has failed. Arabism has failed, communism has failed, imperialism has failed, and there is another proposal um, of a state uh, which offers unity, uh, purity. If That's why a lot of people with criminal background go into, um, uh, into this, because if you have sinned, um, um, the fundamentalists propose you to, 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 to gain more good points in order to erase this sins. Uh, if you die as a, as a martyr, as a shaheed, you will, you know, acting for the good of the Muslim community, you will go straight to heaven. Um, so that will erase your sins. Um, it's a matter, they, they, they propose something linked to dignity, Oh, you are, um, we as Muslims, we were attacked in, in, uh, in, uh, in Iraq, 
uh, in Palestine and so on and so on. You Muslim communities in Europe are being despised, are being, uh, you know, ostracized and so on. Uh, we offer you dignity. Um, Islam means um, to, to, to submit, uh, but there is, in this message is something about pride, you know, it's very, very strong. So feel proud, proud to be a Muslim with us. And also, um, they offer a feeling of fraternity, you know, it's really important, the, the peer affirma affirmation that the uh, camaraderie or the brotherhood, as you may know in the attacks in, in Paris, through the Charlie Hebdo um, newspaper, but also at Bataclan, um, sometimes there were, uh, many times there were two brothers or a, band, a, a group of friends. I mean, this feeling of belonging to, um, um, to, to, to a group, you know, this uh, um, male bonding as well, all this is very important. So, um, I mean, the caliphate is really offering a very competitive uh, um, proposal and a very attractive to proposal in a world where the other political um, yeah, or policies or strategy has um, failed or seem to in their perspective, have failed. Yeah, um, I think um, you. Uh, I'm I'm completely with you. Um, I only had have to add some things. Uh, for example, Syria is uh, like a proxy war between. Uh, it, it is like a proxy war between uh, Shia and uh, Sunni Muslims. Uh, in the view of the uh, Wahhabi uh, Salafi movement, uh, Shias are even worse than uh, Americans or Jews. Yeah? Uh, and uh, it was uh, yeah, labeled or branded as, uh, as such, as a war between uh, Shias and uh, Sunnis. And so this attracted a lot of people because the first time uh, Sunnis uh, or jihadists uh, had the chance to to fight directly uh, against uh, Shias, and um, um, and in my point of view, uh, there is one thing more to add, uh, but I think it's also written in your book uh, about the apocalyptic uh, um, aspect uh, in the Syrian war, uh, and maybe you can add it because uh, I think in the Quran uh, there is uh, a place in Syria where the Messiah is fighting against the e big evil. Maybe you want to add Dabik. it. The big, the big is the place. So there is really. A certain there is a place in whoops uh, in Syria where uh, where the Quran uh, names it and where they fight the final war against evil and this is also really attracting to the people because uh, the uh, ISIS or Daesh uh, can can uh, can use this as a tool to attract uh, more and more uh, Muslims yeah and um, yeah um, the other things were already said maybe you want to add. Yes, I think that this reference to theology of uh, the so-called Islamic State is crucial here because sometimes we can hear that all Muslims uh, are in favor of um, caliphate because if caliphate is there it means that um, everyone has to ad adhere with its uh, rules however caliphate is a self-proclaimed uh, entity there would have to be a consensus between all the Muslims to have a real caliphate and it, it is impossible to have a consensus between between uh, hundreds of millions of people. So after the removal of the caliphate in Turkey, it is impossible to have one caliphate again. And what we have to remember as well is that in Arab countries, Muslim theology on the low level has a very poor quality which is related to the general low level of education and this theory does not have a modern approach to Quran 
te, jakby literalnie, prawda, tylko to jest przenośnia i że teraz na przykład... When it comes to the literal or metaphoric meaning of Quran, we know what happened to Abu Zaid, who was trying to read Quran in this way in, in Egypt. He was forced to leave Egypt and to, to uh, have a divorce with his wife. And the government support concrete interpretation of Quran and young people are very often confronted with this low-level interpretation of Quran. And I saw a picture of uh, people from ISIS praying uh, and uh, they were praying in two rows. However, it turned out that one of the rows is not directed uh, at Mecca, which is uh, which is not in line with uh, the rules of Islam. And there has been an open letter to al-Baghdadi, and there is also an uh, Arabic version of this letter, where Muslim theologists point to all theological mistakes uh, done by ISIS in its activities, which shows how primitive the interpretation proposed by ISIS is. However, it works, it functions properly because it is directed at those who have no chance uh, to get familiar with the uh, high level uh, theology that is presented by universities. And you mentioned that this is a proxy war. And you're right saying this. This is indeed a proxy war. And what we should not forget is that every state is trying to pursue its aim. For example, Kurds who are fighting for survival with the so-called Islamic State. And they are the only group that has its stake, real stake, in this war. On the other hand, Turkey, well, how should I put it, is not friendly towards Kurds. They're trying to fight Kurds despite of the fact that they are in the coalition against ISIS. So this all makes it very complicated. Okay, there are still lots of questions and issues that should be raised. The issue of radicalism, the links between uh, the radicalization of European Muslims with what's going on in the Middle East. Well, during a panel that lasted for 90 minutes, it is obviously impossible to raise all these issues. The conclusion that we should draw from this debate is that there is no black or white solutions. Uh, and if anyone suggests uh, a solution, probably he or she does not know what they're talking about because they are not easy solutions to these problems. If you have any short questions, feel free to ask them. However, we do not have time for any statements uh, by the audience. Uh, they have to be made uh, at the backstage. Any short questions? And please speak into the mic. Uh, good afternoon. You raised the issue of Turkish society in Germany and the radicalization of next generation of Turks. And I would like to ask about systemic solutions implemented by Germany and in general by Europe. Systemic solutions that were aimed at integrating migrants into the European society. They come from from totally different background, they speak different language. So I wonder how much Europe has done, in your case Germany, to integrate these people into the society. Well, we, we speak about radicalization. Radicalization is very dangerous, but what has Europe done to prevent radicalization? Thank you. Okay, so I suggest we collect questions first, and then we leave some time for the panelists to answer. 
answer the questions. Any other short question? Uh, I would like to ask what uh, Muslim groups um, suiciders are recruited from? Is it the Muslim Brotherhood or other groups? Or are there any groups that make it impossible for its members to commit suicide? Any other short questions? A second row from behind. Take a step back for a second from this very current context and uh, uh, ask a question uh, in terms of, like, every religion is having its uh, violent elements, uh, yet at the same time uh, in Islam we are having the, the, the very roots, uh, in the very roots of Islam we are having the conquest and the most cons constitutive uh, person for the religion, which was at the same time a political leader and was leading people into the battle. I was wondering to which extent, in your opinion, does this shape the um, dynamics of the societies, uh, of the Muslim societies? And in the same uh, context, uh, how can we expect uh, Islam to be how far liberal uh, in terms of uh, Without still being consistent and without the suppression of the state. Dobra, dziękuję i proponuję ostatnie pytanie, bo po prostu na tyle. Okay, and the last questions. The last question, as we do not have time for more questions. A woman in a dark blue jacket. Um, I just wanted to ask, you mentioned during your presentation the women's clothing as a measure of radicalism, talking about how as time went on the society kind of, uh, it was a use of the hijab and other forms of clothes as a protest of the government. I was asking um, if that only existed in this context, in that one context, or if that's used as a measure um, to, as a measure for radicalism in a society. That's it. Dobrze, to proponuję po prostu, żeby państwo odpowiadali jako Okay, now I suggest that you answer the questions that you would like to ask, that you would like to answer. The question, I think, was uh, posed directly at me. Um, I think, first of all, we have to look uh, at the German situation. Um, we attracted these labor forces. Whoops. Um, we attracted these labor forces, <coughs> and um, there was a deal between Germany and Turkey and a lot of other countries, <coughs> like Italy. After the Second World War, we needed a labor forces, and they were only seen as labor forces. They were not seen as people with identities. They were just, uh, they, they were put in housings uh, next to the uh, um, industry uh, facilities, uh, living with six, uh, six or seven people in one room. Uh, and uh, yeah, they uh, partly, in the, uh, especially in the beginning, they, were, they weren't even, even here with their families. So, uh, and after uh, uh, some years, I think 72 or something, they stopped this uh, attraction of labor forces. Uh, what happened then is uh, that the first wave of migrants, they, uh, they uh, called their families to Germany, and it was not hindered by that law. And, but still, up to that moment, uh, they were still thinking that they are going back somewhere, some, somehow, somewhere, uh, and uh, they were like uh, living on a on packed, uh, packed uh, valise, um, uh, luggage. Uh, so uh, always ready to leave, and that's what they taught their children. Um, and yeah, that was a failure also from the German government. They taught them only Turkish. They taught them uh, how to live when they leave, uh, when they leave that country. Not to get it. it was very difficult to get the German citizenship. Yeah, that's, uh, that's a point. That's a, that was the failure in the first wave. And now we come to, uh, you ask what did they do uh, to change it, or what are the, the good uh, experiences or um, approaches uh, what they made to integrate these people. Yeah, they changed uh, in, uh, in 2000 or 2005, they changed uh, the nationality law. So uh, it was, uh, before that, it was only by blood, uh, like use uh, Zangnis uh, uh, was uh, existing. Now it's, uh, it's something mixed in Germany existing uh, between use Zangnis and uh, use Soli. And uh, so 
the people now can feel also as a citizen because they have that citizenship, German citizenship. They are now allowed uh, to, to get it more easily. Before they, you had to live like 15 years in Germany. Now it's like seven years, uh, at least half of it. So uh, then you can uh, apply to, uh, to citizenship. Uh, and what they did, uh, um, the German situation is a little bit different to other countries. We, uh, the, the German society, perceived themselves never, never as a, a country of migration. They, uh, there was migration, these labor forces, uh, but they were not see, uh, still not seen. They, uh, they didn't see themselves as, uh, as a country of migration. And there was the Aussiedler. Uh, um, the, the people with German, from German heritage, from the... Uh, uh, Eastern Europe or Russia, they were coming to Germany, and there they uh, made that program, this is a special settlement programs uh, for, for these people, because they knew they're going to stay here. And uh, the, so this is a, a little bit the framework. And in the, in the 2000, uh, there was a structural change, a shift in policy. Uh, and the policy makers and the elites, uh, they view uh, themselves or Germany differently. They, uh, they started uh, to accept that uh, it's a country of migration, and now they started to implement some, uh, some instruments, like uh, there was in 2005, there was a, a big um, national action plan uh, involved with a lot of NGOs and so on, and they, there they made up some things, uh, what to implement to... Uh, Structural, uh, uh, as a structure in uh, in in, uh, in politic in the political context. So, um, um, and what they also did uh, in this period of time, they empowered these actors of uh, of uh, immigrant um, associations as as uh, um, a partner of dialogue. So, uh, beginning in 2000, they openly accepted the representatives of that associations as partners of integration. And there the failure starts again, because these associations are often strongly linked to uh, the states where they stem from. So, we are doing, uh, we, they did something good, but with the wrong partners again. That's the situation in Germany a little bit. Dziękuję. To może myślę, że przejdźmy do następnego pytania. Przypominam, to było pytanie, czy jakieś... Let us move on to another question. The question was about organizations. Uh, which organizations are fewer terrorists attackers in the countries? To, to simplify this question. I don't think there is anyone who is an expert of terrorism. There is special research on that, which groups or which individuals are particularly susceptible to uh, those kinds of uh, requests or suggestions to be suiciders. In Islam, suicide is a sin. It only God should decide when a human ends his or her life. But of course you can use religion in many different ways. And I talked about poor level of education. And of course, this is again a psychological impact. You uh, identify uh, individuals who might be susceptible, like Palestinians, in the fight. They use suiciders in their fighting because they see no other reason, another way of um, reaching their outcome. So we're probably talking about terrorist organizations because most Muslim organizations would think that suicide is uh, really a grave sin. It's probably just a way of attracting attention in very much the same way as uh, um, Palestinians or uh, the organization of, um, the, for the uh, liberation of Palestine also use suiciders. And um, for instance, there is an opinion that the 9-11 uh, 
seven attacks were almost the end because al-Qaeda just failed to win more support in Muslim countries and they took a big step to show that they were strong and this is where it started all over again. And now ISIS has been suffering some failures uh, on their own ground, so they're exporting those attacks to Europe and they do find people who are spiritually ready to die, to lay their lives for uh, the cause and they are very susceptible to persuasion and they are somehow, they get convinced uh, that a uh, suicide attack might be okay despite what the religion says. The Muslim Brotherhood, uh, Muslim Brotherhood is a political uh, movement. Um, officially, I mean, its official stances um, is against the use of violence to gain power. So um, they never advocated for uh, suicide attacks or whatsoever. Um, the thing we have to keep in mind is that the Muslim Brotherhood uh, now uh, is facing a huge repression, for instance, in Egypt, and some of its members are now thinking that the democratic transition promised has failed, um, has not fulfilled their hopes. So some of them are now turning to violent actions. So there might be, I won't, I'm not sure, a porosity, but it's not actually, it's not the, 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 the main trend in the Muslim Brotherhood. Um, I'm, s I, I, I'm not completely, um, I cannot completely follow this argumentation because uh, once they are in force, and what you can see was the AKP uh, in Germany, uh, in Turkey, in Turkey. It, uh, they, uh, they imported the ideology of the Muslim Brotherhood. So once you are in force, mm -hmm. when you took over mm -hmm. the power of the state, then you use that force. And so it is somehow they have uh, they they you they are they can. Um, no, they, I, I, I was meaning I, I was, not, I was meaning terror but, terrorist but, attacks. Yeah, terrorist. <laughs> okay. The use of force. <laughs> but uh, just to make that c point clear, and uh, but there is another thing, maybe uh, a unique thing uh, linked to Syria. In Syria, there was also uh, I, I think around about twenty thousand soldiers uh, only f uh, as the arm of the Muslim Brotherhood in Syria was also, uh, they had also forces, militia forces there. Of course, uh, it's uh, the situation there, but they also use for uh, the weapon when uh, they need, yeah. then when they have to. But it was related to suicide attacks. Mm -hmm. yeah. oh. And the most difficult question, is there indeed in the doctrine of uh, uh, Islam and the fact that the prophet uh, Muhammad was not only a prophet but he was also a political activist, a politician, let's say it, mm, and in, in a sense, initially, early on, when Islam existed, there was uh, there were lands being conquered and the state was being uh, established with new territories. Does that imply that Islam tends to use violence? So is there any link between the doctrine and how this religion emerged and the fact that today Islam is used as an excuse for violence? I think the greatest problem is that there is no single authority in religion who could say that this interpretation is right and another interpretation is wrong. There is freedom and you can follow any whichever interpretation you like. So it's not like the Catechism or the Roman Catholic Church, a big blue book which says here and here this is uh, Catholic Orthodoxy, whatever else is unorthodox. We have um, in Poland, quite a lot of orthodoxy, meaning uh, living by the book um, in uh, Christianity. But in Islam, you have no bishop and you have no congregation of faith that could teach Muslims how to live. And there are pieces and excerpts of Quran that were quoted here and now, and they talk about fighting in war. We do need to remember that Muhammad is, of course, you know, a role model for Muslims, but that was 
a historical context. So very often what happens is contemporary Muslims who do not really take part in violence, well, they explain, well, he used to be a political uh, leader, and at that time any leader had to fight for his own community. Nowadays we have different means and different resources. So the interpretation goes that the violence is a thing of the past, and now the prophet is a moral role model rather than him being a political leader. And again, there are some literal interpretations and also metaphorical interpretations. And so there are people who try to read the Bible by the letter of it, like God created the world in seven days and so on. And there are Muslims who read the Quran literally, and some of them interpret the Quran because according to Islam, Ahmad Khan was a man who uh, should, should tell you whether the interpretation is right or wrong, meaning the time and the place, and uh, uh, whether or not the Quran is, uh, has a good grasp of modernity. And there should be different interpretations, one for Europe, for Germany, maybe for the UK. There might be a different interpretation proper for Iraq or Saudi Arabia or Iran, and for our times and for the past. And we Muslims uh, inherit the interpretation from the past, but we are people who can use our reasoning so we can adopt different interpretations. There are some thinkers, like in Germany, Professor Mohammed Hurshid uh, is a thinker in Germany who promotes contextual reading of the Quran, and he says that certain verses from the Quran were sent at a particular moment of time and that was the seventh century, and was supposed to correspond to the mentality of people in the seventh century. But now we're smarter. Some time has passed, so we have our brains, and we can actually reinterpret the holy book to match our contemporary times. This view is not very widespread in um, modern in Muslim countries, but it's quite widespread in Europe. My colleague, um, Marta Vitbeitz, wrote um, a book about Tariq Ramadan, uh, has been recently published. Uh, he is um, another thinker. He was a son -in -law of Hassan al-Banna, the founder of the Muslim Brothers, and he uh, is a European uh, Muslim, and he even wrote a book to be a European Muslim. Uh, and going back to the matter of hijab, just briefly, we're talking niqab, and niqab and hijab are different because hijab is just any cover. Uh, hijab is uh, a headscarf that covers the hair. Niqab covers your face, which is far less popular, and it's applied by highly conservative societies. And it is very often a sign that a woman is undergoing radicalization. She's covering up her face. Professor Karish from Sarajevo says that Islam does not really tell women to cover her face, because there are some excerpts in Quran which say, well, there is some uh, expression on a woman's face, so there is some kind of fem um, exaggeration. And I know it must Muslim feminists who interpret the Quran in favor of women, and they wear hijab. But it's not the case that a woman wearing hijab, she's a fundamentalist, or wearing a headscarf, is not, does not mean that she's liber not liberal. There are very harsh, radical feminists wearing headscarves, and it's worth listening to them. Um, so they would promote their radical views and saying that they are faithful to the religion and by wearing headscarves, they are reinterpreting the Quran, and on the basis of religion, they just promote and uh, exercise their rights as women. We really need to almost come to a close, so just a couple of sentences to wrap up. Mohanad Koshid, he is a, a member of our board of Muslim Forum of Germany. Uh, and just for you to know, he uh, has to be protected by police, because only he is thinking openly. He wants a controversial discussion. He wants uh, something modern, uh, at least a discussion. And um, that, that is, uh, there are uh, some actors who really want to prevent this. Um, and that's, uh, there's another point, uh, just uh, as um, to the end I want to point out is um, we shouldn't look and build up or establish an Islamic authority. Uh, I think the 
most important uh, thing is that we accept mus uh, the, uh, the Islamic world, the Ummah, as diverse. And um, what, we, what went wrong in Germany is that they tried to establish one central organ, the institution, and this is the Koordinationsrat der Muslime, but this is dominated now and still is by uh, rather uh, orthodox conservative uh, forces and uh, actors. So the controversy is uh, the most, uh, the, the most uh, important point in my view that we uh, allow them to discuss and uh, make a framework where Muslims can discuss about their own religious beliefs and where they are not, um, uh, where, where they don't have uh, to be afraid of being punished, uh, uh, or having the death penalty because of different views. Yeah, the last thing is you were talking about um, having a frame for that. Uh, for most of the fundamentalists, there is a kind of um, anti-system <laughs> uh, point of view. They are rejecting um, the authorities, the legit, well, well, what we see as legitimate authorities, the state, um, the, the, the imam of the mosque, the one who was appointed by a, a religious or a political authority, um, they are rejecting authorities such as the medias, I mean mainstream medias, we are liars, I mean we are considered as liars. So, in that's why it's really hard to, to confront this issue, is that it's really a new system, a new world they are um, trying to, to build. And ISIS is trapping us. Uh, ISIS is trapping the Muslim communities around the world by, with the, a, a binary alternative. You're with us or you, are, or you are with them. And they are trapping us in I mean, when I say us, not, um, I'm talking about non-Muslims. Uh, they are asking, they are challenging us, you know, in our, our response to what they are doing. ISIS is just like a troll on the internet. If they are tra trying to attract us on, on their territory, and they want us to answer with a very binary answer, if we do so, we let them win. Thank you very much. My thanks go to all the members of our panel discussion. Thank you very much, um, the audience, for staying longer. And uh, thank you very much for your attention, for your participation.